Um, first, a couple of pol apologies, if it's okay. Uh, as usual, when I come to London, I walk off at King's Cross and I immediately feel underdressed. So sorry for that. Um, and secondly, when I first accepted this, my first public speaking event in five years, and first doing CCS, and when Clive asked me if I would do it, I thought, great, small venue, small number of people. I then walked out of the uh, elevator this evening and thought, bugger. <laughs> so, so bear with me, please. Um, I was asked to talk and give an industry view, and I'll be doing a lot of qualifications on my industry view. It all depends on exactly where you're coming from as to what it, it is, I think. Um, I could probably sum it up in five words and keep this really short, which is not for the faint-hearted. You've probably got that already this evening. So, a bit more about Millennium. Um, it was briefly mentioned there, Millennium Generation was the original business. It actually evolved out of my previous role in Power Fuel Power. Um, which I'll mention again later on. But we were developing a large-scale commercial IGCC project, and one of the things through the design, and I mentioned this this evening, I think, to Den, was as you go from feasibility through feed, you suddenly realize how much parasitic load you're getting. You think, holy cow, how can this be commercial? And I started working with an Australian company called Calix to see if we could develop a gas cleanup system that was more economical to sit within a gasification design um, plant. Uh, when I left Power Fuel Power, they dissolved their relationship with Power Fuel. They re established it with me. We formed Millennium. Millennium secured R&D fund, innovation funding from DEC at the end of 2012. And since then, we've been taking forward um, a feed, which we completed eventually this March for, as um, Clever said, a one megawatt thermal facility. It's not a standalone though, and I will come back to explaining these other ones, but just quickly introduce them. There are three other entities. Um, Millennium Environmental, which is intended to be uh, the development vehicle, the project vehicle for utilizing uh, the capture system. And then two others, one which is called Natural Resources, which is focused on in-situ conversion of coal into natural gas, not UCG. Um, and the last one, which is uh, Millennium Asset Management, which is, um, in the process of securing licensing rights to deploy fuel additives predominantly, which reduce consumption of fuels uh, by 10 to 15 percent. So it has a whole environmental slant. Everything in each of these businesses is designed to be reduction on greenhouse gas emissions orientated. So there's a synergy and there is a rationale for why they're there. Um, context. Where am I coming from? Um, I've never worked for major utilities, and they would probably have a very different view on this. So putting it in my context, I'm sitting in a business that has no balance sheet, effectively. Um, that makes it very challenging for raising money and gain, getting people interested. Um, we have no strategic motivation, because we have no existing asset base that we're looking to protect its future on, and we have no operational necessity to do anything. What we're trying to be is entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial technology leader. We all want to come up and bring to the market that technology which will be the ultimate catalyst for really driving carbon capture forward. That's our objective. And I think you've already got from the previous two speakers this has been a challenge for about two decades. And even now I'd say we're probably still in an infant market state. We haven't got to the point whereby there is a commercial necessity to capture or a benefit to capture CO2. So it's people who are developing technologies who really are trying to push them down people's throats to get them interested in wanting to take it forward. There's a number of challenges in doing that. When I started drafting this and coming up with quotes from the press and headlines, I ended up with about five slides, and I started to crystallize those just down to a few. But one of the biggest challenges, I think, has been the fact that externally there's this sensationalism and there has been for a long time around carbon capture and storage and climate change. Limited consensus around that either. Um, you've got a number of different parties all with differing agendas whether they're politics, lobbying groups, activists, developers like myself who will tell you it's fantastic and we should crack on and you should fund us, um, and academics. Press takes all of that they come up with a headline, and they usually crystallize around two things, which I think are personified here. The cost of actually doing this, yeah, and the doomsday event that will come if we don't do something. Neither sounds great to anybody. 
I think there's a couple of key reasons why this keeps going on. I think it was touched on in Dents. He, he mentioned or inferred the thing of an evolving science. You know, carbon capture and storage and climate change to an extent has been an evolving science over the past, you know, 20 odd years, probably longer than that. Um, and the challenge with that, when it's an evolving situation, you get a lot of people involved in it who are focused on, you know, I'll call them the academic kind of approach, which is, okay, hypothesis, prognosis, um, prognosis, investigation, analysis, diagnosis, conclusion. What they don't come up with as a conclusion, though, is a final statement. It becomes iterative, and we go around the cycle again. And the whole list of technologies that we'll put up, I think, demonstrates that. And the longer it goes on, somebody else will come with another technology and add into the mix. And it adds uncertainty to an extent. What is the right time, then, to actually start moving forward? Have we got the best commercial opportunity yet? I'm mostly going to finish by telling you, yes, you do, and it's us, and please, you know, government, take it back, Will. <laughs> um, the second thing, then, is that comes out of this, so you've got all that uncertainty, I think, around those two key areas, is when do you, you know, do you, don't you? Do you invest in it now? Don't you invest in it now? Do you tackle the issue or don't you tackle it? And if you tackle it, is CCS actually a core part of that solution? And I think it's only just now that we're starting to get some policy that's actually shaping it and saying, yes, it will be a part of that solution. It is part of the future energy mix. So that's one another reason why it's taken so long, I guess, to get to this point. <coughs> um, you then get on some direct challenges that you face as a developer. Um, if you're familiar with the ETI documents that they've been pu pushing out, some of these, I think, are, are detailed in there. Um, and I haven't taken all of them out, just the ones that I guess I probably em empathize with the most. So the investability challenges, economies of scale, uh, what size do you do it at? What is a good size? And I'll jump between these. A lot of those, the economies of scale piece, for me, has never really been associated to a capture facility. And we, we identified a couple of plants that have been taken forward. They've got finite cap you know, generation capacities. There's a finite design that you can actually get to on the capture piece when you take forward and demonstrate it. The bigger issue is, and it came out, I think, in both presentations, is what the hell do you do with the transport and storage infrastructure? Do you have a good store? Is it viable? Is it secure? What scale do you build it to? Do you build it a 5 million tonne to satisfy and service the needs of one, or are you more aspirational to look on that future? And I think we're starting to get to some policy that's crystallizing the fact that we need to be designing for hubs. But let's bear in mind, you know, that debate has been going on since I started in carbon capture and storage, which was in 2006, and we're getting to that point now. Okay? And we still don't really have a final design, as we've seen. We've got three different options that could be going forward. Um, on the policy side of it, when you're talking to investors, the policy needs to be robust. You need to be able to have confidence in it, that it actually will deliver the environment that you are going to get the money back for your investors. And again, I think we're getting close to that point, but we're not quite there yet. And then you've got the financing structure, which really then ends up becoming a product of the previous two. You know, what is that financing structure? And at the end of that, it's going to be a mix, and it's come out in the previous two, there's a bit of repetition here, but you're talking, you know, state funding in some form, you're talking traditional debt, you're talking, I'll call it enabling debt, like the Green Investment Bank and the European Investment Bank, you're talking private equity, and you're talking industrial equity, you know, the players that are in the market at this point in time. It will be a portfolio who take on the risks of taking this forward, certainly in the early stages. A bit more on the policy side of it. Um, it's the confidence in the policy. You know, what and who can influence that going forward? What's the objectives on the market mix going forward for security of supply and the cost of supply? You know, having an understanding and appreciation, but specifically here, of where fossil fuels can fit into that portfolio. Um, and last but not least, you know, I know we've got this the agenda now for mandatory carbon capture on any new coal-fired stations, but what is the long-term position going to be on making it mandatory for all fossil fuel plants? What really pushes that and makes that enabling? Um, in reality, on the policy side of it, you, we really need to 
make sure we have some clear definition on what is going to be available. And you know, the CFD program, the determination next year, that will really, I think, be a crystallizing point for this. And give something concrete that people like I can sit in front of potential investors and say, this is the opportunity, this is the mechanism to get to it. If I can offer one comment on that going forward, though, um, don't usually get listened to when I provide comments on governmental policy, but we'll give it a bash, seeing as Will's in the room. If there's any competition going forward on CFDs, it needs to be an open competition to all technologies and all providers. You know, one of the challenges and biggest frustrations historically that I've had sat within this industry trying to be a developer is we prejudge scale, we prejudge location, we prejudge technology. You're never going to find that optimum solution. You're never going to find that portfolio of technologies which is the best and the right one to take forward if we make judgments in advance of the mechanism. So it's great that we have a billion pounds funding going into two key projects, but were they the best two projects? You I know, mean, I say that with my background with Power Fuel Power. Um, on the operational technology risk again, I mean, there is risk against first of a kind. Again, on the capture side of it, I think you manage that. The key issue here, and I mean, you saw some of it, I think it was in Dens on the uh, storage piece, the scale of the investigation that has to take place offshore to get it right. You know, if you break something on a capture plant, you can go out and fix it. I mean, if you've driven past uh, Ferry Bridge recently with their fire, they'll sort that out, it can be resolved. Mechanics, electricals, you can fix. You mess around with a geology and you destroy a storage site, then we have a real problem. So there's a lot of risk that sits around that storage, not just its capacity, its integrity, but also, I believe, how it's managed going forward, that will make or break the success of the clusters that you know, potentially could happen here in the UK. Um, the last point, then, is on the business structure side of it. Uh, this is something I guess I didn't have an appreciation of back in 2006 when I started. But what we're actually trying to enable here is a three-tiered continuous process. You know, that doesn't happen in many supply chains, not at the scale it's happening here. That direct transfer of battery limit and handing over a waste product to somebody to handle, particularly they're not in a network like this, where the, the results potentially of failure are much bigger, I think, than if, you know, the gas grid goes down or the electricity grid goes down. So it's much more complex, I've always thought, when you looked at the contracting strategy and the mechanisms for integration around that full supply chain. That I guess I guess one of the things I underestimated going back. Um, I, I apologize, I didn't, I didn't come up with this one, I ripped it from somebody, but it illustrated a reasonable point, and it's coming but at that point, not just about the new science and the academia, but it's all about this first of a kind to nth of a kind mentality. There's always a promise of better performance down the road. And what that gives rise to, and it gives rise to people having a reason to sit back and say, well, hang on a second, maybe today isn't the right today to do it. Maybe we should wait till somebody's made all the mistakes. Maybe we should wait till we've had the third generation go forward, and there'll be a better solution there. So it's another thing that feeds into that waiting game. But that said, all the speculation, all the differing opinions on either side of the fence by all those different parties, I, I conclude three things are pretty much certain. You can certainly agree on the top two. Population is going to increase, has been for a long time. Whoever's forecast you go to is going to keep going. And CO2 levels and concentrations are going to keep going up associated to that. I guess the point at the bottom can still be debated by some. Is temperature going to rise alongside it? I happen to sit on the side of yes, it is. So, that's what's going to happen if we do nothing. And for me, I firmly believe CCS is the core part of actually trying to resolve that and resolve it economically. So, unlocking the investment. I wish I had the answer. Um, if I did, I'd probably be standing in front of you a lot wealthier than I am today. Uh, I've referred to power fuel a couple of times. I actually thought power fuel was the answer. It seemed like it at the time. We had uh, a consented power station project. It was at commercial scale of 900 megawatts. It was contracted. It had performance guarantees. 
on proven technologies. And I had a partner in National Grid Carbon who wanted to build a transport and storage network. We entered an open European competition and won 180 million euros. We put the submission for the first NER 300 competition and were ranked best in Europe. We had a consortium of banks sat behind us, led by Societe Generale, who wanted to provide the debt. And we had Colin Stewart as an equity broker who wanted to take it forward. And we had 160 million of concept clearance funding from the EIB. It's not built. And you have to ask yourself, how, with all of that, which the clarification was back in 2010, you know, on a three-year bill program, do we not have a carbon capture project working in the UK? I know it still sits on the charts as an opportunity site, but we had all that in place. However, well, you know, um, my dad always said, you'll never win spouting common sense, so I'll leave that one there. Um, don't tell him I said he was right, please. So, what are we doing? If you go back a couple of slides and I showed you that curve of first of a kind, nth of a kind, transformational technology. This may be a little bit arrogant. Transformational technology, that's what we believe we're doing with Millennium Generation. Okay? I'm not going to go all sciencey at this point because I don't think this is the right environment. Um, but we have something that we think can answer the four key fundamental problems I believe carbon capture and storage has in terms of being taken forward in the UK. We have to have something that's economical, first and foremost. And by that, the consumer has to be able to pay for it. Uh, we have to have something that gives system flexibility. We've got these aspirations in embedding renewals capacity. And we have to have something that sits in there that can actually be load following and actually support and sponsor that. At the same time, I mentioned earlier on the policy side of it, what's the market mix need to be? There is a security of supply question here, you know, about what is that portfolio? What do we outlaw? Do we stop coal? Do we stop gas? Do we just drive nuclear? You know, what is that mix? And the last one is, and there's been a lot of scaremongering around this over the recent years, is, you know, the fear of blackouts. We actually have to start building something soon. We have a lot of old generating assets. You know, we keep doing, giving them new leases of life. But they're not getting any younger. The problem's not going away. We have to find a route so developers can start making investment decisions to protect our security supply going forward. So how does the index do that? Okay, you see at the top, index stands for endothermic, exothermic balance. Okay, not gonna get techy, I promise you. Um, effectively, on, from a capture side of it, it is energy neutral. It's not parasitic. Um, Dual fuel. I mentioned we started looking at this one with power fuel. It was when we had an IGCC project. But what we were trying to find wasn't just something that actually gave us the opportunity to reduce the parasitic load and reduce the cost base of an IGCC power station. One of the key drivers was to see whether we could actually make it multi-fuel. So if gas price goes up, we could switch to coal. Coal price goes up, we could switch back. CO2 price plummeted, we could just burn natural gas. We were trying to find a utopia point of view with the technology that sat in the middle. Um, we're focusing on above 90% carbon capture, and after the feed, we still see that as deliverable. Uh, we believe we had low following capability. Um, our particular design, I, I mentioned earlier on, you can mitigate some of the carbon capture risks through design. One of the things we're doing here, there's a lot of risk when you're scaling up. Well, we're not actually looking to scale up our core reactor technology to be able to do 450 megawatt on one huge reactor. We're gonna be scaling it to about 50 or 60 megawatt thermal capability. And then literally just build it in arrays. So we actually have a lot of flexibility then how we can actually fold the load and our turn down capability. Our capability will be restricted by the power island rather than it will by our flexibility and capability on the capture plant itself. Um, one of the other advantages of doing that actually, or we believe one of the other advantages of doing that, is we should then have greater control over the process and the performance associated with the technology. You get risks and degradation when you scale things. We're trying to mitigate some of that exposure. All in all, 
I like qualification, I used to do it with power fuel. When I say the next one, net power loss of 4%, that is on the absolute efficiency of a CCGT on 9F technology. Um, when we were doing this with power fuel, we were having conversations with GE, we, we came across no don't pass this point conversation with them. Since we've been doing this millennium, we have further conversations with another gas turbine vendor, and again, we haven't got to a point whereby we see a problem with integration of NDEX into a standard CCGT. Um, and the last point there, levelized cost of electricity with the NDEX. Uh, based on the last latest market information that we have access to, because we don't go out paying for research with our, you know, with our funding, um, we believe we are 15 to 20 percent below the costs of competing technologies. Again, that's based on natural gas. What we're doing at the moment, the demonstrator will be a natural gas demonstrator, but all being well, what we want to do after that is take it forward and actually demonstrate it on um, gas, gas, um, syn gas. I quickly mentioned what I, you know, what we were trying to construct at power fuel. This is an updated version of that because I've taken out boom with coal on its own from this, this picture. Um, but it's trying to give you a better understanding of what I mean about the commodity arbitrage I tried to describe. So you've got the CO2 price on the, the y-axis, um, price of gas on the x-axis, and then effectively um, cost of power going straight through the middle. And it's just an approximation then of how um, the market would shift, the merit would shift in favour of a particular technology in that kind of world where you've got gas, coal with CCS and gas with CCS. So our approach with this is effectively, if the index does what we firmly believe it will do, you have an operating envelope there under any one of those scenarios. What that potentially does is you can economically provide power. You can do it with less installed capacity in the UK. <clears throat> and ultimately, you're benefiting the consumer. So that's aspirationally our objective here, is to make that multi-fuel scenario which is clean on fossil fuel. Back to the, today though, ignore the aspirational. We're trying to get a two megawatt thermal plant off the ground. Do you think that would be easier than a 2.5 billion pound IGCC? It isn't. It's about as difficult. Um, this is just looking at the very simple boxes that you know, we've been going through. The key issues associated to where the costs sit, um, and effectively just trying to optimize our funding. So CapEx, no surprise. Um, we went out aspirationally looking at a standard design life as you would on a power project. We then changed our design life and wiped out a third of the capital expenditure requirement. Okay, it won't last as long, but it'll serve its purpose. Um, we've been focused on the OPEX, looking at our testing and for how long we'll actually be running it and we've reduced that from 12 months down to a three month program to strip out costs. Um, we're working with certain parties to try and enhance our raw fuels and utility supply to see if we can pull those costs down. Um, and on the waste side, we don't actually generate a lot, uh, but it will be a target point. And then the afterlife, what the hell can we do with it once we've, we finish with it? Uh, we're trying to mitigate our demolition costs um, and we're trying to do that by giving it a reincarnation. Now, if anybody's familiar and you're probably not with my joint venture partner, which is Calix. They're a calcination business in Australia. We believe we could give this asset an afterlife, doing something meaningful in the UK. So we're doing some work on actually trying to do that. Um, with all of that, we're still looking for about 15.5 million. So if anybody in the room actually has 15.5 million, please come see me afterwards. Even if you've got part of it, I'm willing for a conversation. The nice thing you do, so you've stripped out the costs, you've got a good basis of design, it's lined the opportunity to the potential investor groups. Uh, this is a bit of a, somebody tells me this is complicated, including the CEO of Calix, um, but there is a reason behind this. I mean, there's two things we need to try and achieve. A, we need to attract the investment and have somebody actually want to stand alongside us and deliver this demonstrator. And secondly, as a shareholder in the originating venture, having put costs in and time into this, do not want to get completely screwed <laughs> and have nothing left to show for it at the end of it. So what we've constructed is we've set up a second business, and I briefly mentioned it earlier on. So Millennium Generation on the left-hand side 
it's going to become an engineering licensing business, like a UOP, um, like a Worley Parsons with their respective um, AGR and SIU technologies. That's what it will do. Uh, it will do the engineering detailing for people who want to deploy the index, and it will license those technologies to them. And we will be looking for some funding in there to complete the detailed engineering design, to pay for the project management of the construction, and to complete all the operational test work that we want to achieve. In your other blocks on the far side, the Millennium Environmental, that has now been set up. Um, I refer to it in some marketing you know, documentation as the EPC contractor of choice. <laughs> um, it may not end up being that, but it will have specific rights to develop the technology. So effectively, what we're vesting in it is a, uh, a significantly diminished royalty structure to construct up to 900 megawatts worth of capacity based on the index. And we're also looking to develop a pipeline of projects that sit within that. So we will go. We're trying to target a site and currently trying to negotiate this where we have the ability to go from the 2 megawatt demonstrator to scale it to that 50 megawatt, 60 megawatt facility next, which then allows us to say, OK, well, now can we build a 450 megawatt or 900 megawatt facility? That's what we want to do through that entity. And through putting those licensing rights into that vehicle, we're trying to give that investor the incentives to want to be part of it. Um, again, I think this came out of an ETI document, but um, say package the investment, be ahead of the curve, say what you're good at. That's our indicative forecast on cost line. I mean, the starting point's accurate, artistic license on where we end up a little bit there. Um, but we are in, our, in that bracket today. And it's important coming into an investor who's looking at this that they understand that and can see that. Um, I went through the curve with the IGCC, and I think I said earlier wrong, we started with a fantastic you know, performance efficiency of the station. Um, we finished the feasibility, went down a little bit. Uh, we started to work through the feed, and you just watched the number just go like that, and you came to the end of it, and you sat back and you thought, well, how the hell did we get here? You know, and the funding that was required went like that. Um, we've gone from our feasibility, we've gone through two stages of feed study, and we're still in the same ballpark in terms of what we see our outturn costs and performance efficiencies being. So when you've done that, find that visionary person who actually wants to work with you on it. Um, and they're few and far between. If you've been watching on carbon capture and storage over the past decade, how many utilities have got involved in carbon capture and walked away from it? And those few that are actually left doing it, which are probably two, <laughs> you know, already have some funding and already have their technology of choice. They've picked their horse, they've backed it, they want to run with it. For me, sat here, this particular piece, there are a very small number of people we can actually go to who might be interested in this. And I assure you, we're talking to every one of them. Um, so what do you do if that doesn't work? You see if you can package it up a different way. This again is where people tell me I'm getting far too um, difficult in the structures I'm trying to present. But I'm trying to find an answer to the problem. The answer to the problem is how the hell do we find 15 and a half million pounds worth of funding if I can't find that visionary person? So this isn't mine. This came out of a, a professor at Imperial College and they probably didn't even intend it for the I'm using it. I'm sure he had some different uh, dialogue that went with it. But if you heard of what we're trying to do now, is I'm trying to set up a cluster, a group of companies, investment opportunities, that ticks the majority of the boxes that you can see there. They retain their green credentials, they're focused on stability, they're not focused on one project, they're focused on a pipeline of projects. They're trying to provide an opportunity beyond the carbon capture piece, but effectively trying to leverage that other opportunity to get the funding we need for the carbon capture piece. There, don't worry, two more slides. Which comes back to where I kind of where I started. We have these four businesses. We have two on this side, which are carbon capture dependent. They need that sponsorship, state sponsorship. We already have state sponsorship for it, but we need now the balance of funding. They don't have a flow on um, commercial life, so we're talking pure equity. <coughs> if I find that, in that uh, industry sponsor, that's great. They'll move forward. If not, we're on the far side, which are technologies which are at the point of commercialization. 
they can be delivered now. We have a site that we can go to for the natural resources project. And the far one, um, we have a structure in place to actually be able to take that forward. They will generate cash, and through that, we're hoping to then engage with a different type of sponsor to get them interested in working with us on the capture piece. We're effectively acting like a green fund, but rather than a green fund pulling the projects together, we're doing that bit for them and saying, there you go, are you interested? So in conclusion, um, I think we're still in pre-infancy nearly. I don't think we've actually even got to an infant market yet. Uh, I hope it comes soon. The certainty of store, I think I've emphasized enough. If, um, I speak a bit of authority on that. My profession originally was mining engineering. I did petroleum engineering at university. I understand the issues around geology and mechanics of well modeling. Um, that long-term energy and environmental policy is the key. What are we going to impose on the power sector in the UK? Return on investment will continue to be a challenge until we get crystallization on that one above. Um, they say keep it simple, and I trust you. I've done my damnedest. Powerful was intended to be simple, and it didn't work. <laughs> so <laughs> where are we are now, we're trying to make it palatable. We're trying to box something up in a different way to see if we can find a different route to actually get this to the market. Thank you.